Hi, I'm Ian Olson. Uh, welcome to our growth surgeries. Uh, I'm here as a guest of Simplicity today to talk about the top five recruitment sectors for growth in the UK for the next 12 months. Okay, so exciting times ahead. Um, I think you all know who I am by now. Um, I've been in recruitment a number of years and we work annually with about 20 to 30 recruitment agencies, most of whom are typically growing. And this is a blog that I've done for a number of years now. Um, first time I did it was about uh, seven or eight years ago and we've had over 20,000 views to our main blog of what are the main sectors for growth for the next 10 years. But today we're going to focus on the top, the top five for the next 12 months. And um, essentially where we are today is after Christmas we actually now have a stable government. We have certainty over where Brexit is going to go and so as a result of that um, it's a little easier to see into the future. And most of the commentators are now feeling a little bit more confident that we're going to see a little bit of stable um, economic conditions going forward. So I also, like them, are sensing that we are likely to see a post-Brexit uh, positive boom, let's say, in the economy. Um, the uncertainty of a Brexit's gone. We've got the stable government. There's a le quite a high level of pent-up demand across the UK and from foreign investors. Uh, UK is planning to spend considerable, to uh, increase government spending. And we've also in recent weeks heard that China and the US have signed the first steps of a major trade deal which will remove the uncertainty that's been around that for some time. So I see growth in the UK for the next 12 months across all sectors as being stronger, but the effect of that is likely to be more positive, more positive on certain sectors than others. Okay, so the key conditions that we'll be talking about today in recruitment terms are the sectors where the demand for staff exceeds supply. And in order for you guys to make the most of that opportunity, there needs to be a reasonable level of supply. Uh, we're not going to complicate this anymore. Um, so these are the three sectors that we identified as being outside our top five. So, and there's a reason which I'll go through for all of these. So the public sector excluding healthcare, very important we mention that. There is additional funding from the UK government um, across the whole raft of the public services. Um, the age of austerity, as it was being called and labelled, is coming to an end, as according to the Chancellor. Um, and the uncertainty around where we're going to be as a country and economy has, has disappeared or is starting to disappear. So we see there to be, a, we're seeing an increase or a likely increase in public sector expenditure over the next 12, 18 months, two years. So I think there'll be a lot more opportunities for recruitment businesses to uh, sell into their existing markets within the public sector. I would not, at this point, recommend that you go out and set yourself up as a recruitment company and target this sector as a, as a whole. I think the future is a little bit uncertain still, and we're still seeing, or I'm hearing, some post-IR35 disturbances in that marketplace. And, and what I mean by IR35, it's the way HMRC are applying the rules at the moment to the public services, will come on later and touch what's happening in the private sector or potentially happening uh, later in the presentation. So that's the public services. Financial services sector, again, there's been some positive news coming out of the city in the last few weeks. The uncertainty over what's happening with Brexit is becoming clearer. There's a bit more positivity around the effects of the US-China trade deal being signed and the economic um, tariff wars that were being uh, discussed earlier last year or last year, but it's still a little bit uncertain. We're not 100% sure where we're going to end up, whether we're going to have full passporting or not full passporting. So for that reason, we've not included financial services in our top five. And the final sector, which is also just outside the top five, is logistics. Um, yes, we've got a bit of post-Brexit stability. We are not anticipating on the 31st of January a cliffhanger with a no-deal Brexit and huge um, queues at our ports. But as a result of the uncertainty we've had over the preceding 6 to 12 months, we have uh, warehouses that are at capacity or as close to capacity as they possibly could be. We didn't have as good a Christmas as people were hoping, so those warehouses haven't started to empty as quickly as we thought. 
and consumer spending is a little bit on the low side as the recent figures came out. Um, so that's why this area is not something we're tipping for growth, but hopefully it'll become clearer as the year goes on as to the opportunities in this sector. Um, I think there's a national trend with online shopping away from the high street towards large uh, distribution centers and, and a fulfillment from those sort of locations by the internet. So I don't think this is a trend that's going to go away or a sector that's going to diminish. But what I do expect to see over the next five to ten years is higher levels of automation and investment from the government. Okay, so let's start with the, f the first sector. So the first sector we've put in our top five at number five is energy. Um, and our reason for picking this as one of the high growth sectors for the next 12 months is, first of all, long term trends. So the energy sector has set for some strong growth over the next, I would say, five to 10 years. Um, we have at the moment a, a relatively stable oil price above the magic $50 a barrel, which seems to be the level at which the uh, oil industry seems positive about investment in exploration and growth. When I looked at it uh, the other, this morning, they were about 60 to $65, depending where you're borrowing uh, your oil from. Um, so that's quite a good, healthy level. Um, there is some uncertainty around some of the political uh, disruption in the Middle East, so with Iran and America making noises towards each other. Um, and that obviously causes a bit of concern. But that stability means at least the background growth that has been there in oil and liquefied gas will continue for some time. The big area of opportunity, the big area for growth is in renewables. In the UK, the UK government has committed to being carbon neutral by 2050. Um, the EU has made commitments to carbon reduction by the end of this year. So the EU uh, nations are already moving towards this. And they are due to set another target for 2030 during uh, summits that take place during 2020. At the moment, across Europe, there are roughly 566 thousand uh, workers in the sector and the latest figures we've seen are that there will be an additional need for 221,000 by 2027. So that means in the next seven years there will be a huge number of jobs to be filled, the people don't exist, so you can see the opportunity for recruitment companies to help organisations in this sector grow are, are, are obviously there. And this was one of the questions uh, that was asked of us is which sectors would be good to go into in the, for the next five to ten years. This would be a great sector. It's underserved at the moment, uh, rates of pay are good, the workers are transitory across the UK and Europe um, and obviously so it, it's a great sector, great sector to be in and, and yeah, if I was looking to open a recruitment agency, in fact I'll declare my vested interest my middle son is graduating from Manchester University this year and he wants to go into this sector. So that's the best I can say. I recommend if you're in an agency, this is a good sector to be in. And number four, healthcare. So we excluded it from the public sector figures generally, but I think healthcare for the next certainly five years is a great sector to be in. Um, the government, the UK government has committed to spend an extra just under 34 billion pounds between now and 2023, 24 fiscal year. So that is in the next two to three years. Um, they're looking to recruit an extra 31,500 more nurses, an extra 5,000 GPs, extra auxiliary and support staff. And so this commitment to, to grow these numbers, um, when they obviously don't exist in the UK at the moment or in the trained in, uh, in these numbers in the UK means we're having to recruit from overseas. So for the UK recruitment agency market, this is a great market opportunity for you to support the UK's government in trying to grow those numbers. Uh, and I do expect the agencies that are operating in this sector already to be you know, getting their plans in place to start filling some of these numbers and working collaboratively with their local trusts to help fill those vacancies. Um, I was the a former public sector director of a major recruitment company in the UK. People will already know that. Uh, my guys um, helped grow their business quite substantially. 
So this is an area I know a lot about. It's an area I've been closely involved with. It's not an easy area to break into for a brand new agency starting up. If you're not in healthcare at the moment, there are a number of barriers to entry. You need to get yourself on frameworks. Yes, there are opportunities to do off framework spend. Uh, I'm not necessarily going to advocate that, but I do uh, see it as a great opportunity for businesses. So for simplicity customers, some of you have already asked this. Yes, it's a great area to be in. Strengthen your relationships. Look at your rates of pay. Look at your operating models. Work closely with your clients. Try and find out what their long-term demands are. Great sector. Um, and number three, engineering. So as the UK as government announced uh, just uh, recently, they are committed to spending an extra £100 billion over the next five years. The reason for that is long-term interest rates are at the lowest they've ever been. Uh, and so it makes sense to borrow money to invest in capital projects, which increases the productivity and the efficiency of the country. Um, so in terms of the types of commitment to projects we're talking about, in terms of engineering alone, um, and you'll notice we haven't talked about construction here. We'll come on and talk about that in a minute. Um, the sorts of engineering projects are full fiber broadband, uh, the Northern Powerhouse. Um, the, there's talk of a fairly large uh, gigafactory, uh, battery uh, gigafactory to be built in the UK. And the reason for this is that the UK is one of the richest, if not the richest nation on earth for wind and tidal energy. Um, but the challenge with that is that energy is intermittent. So what we need to do is have the ability to store the energy when we have large amounts of it so that we can then release it into the national grid uh, at times when obviously the wind's not blowing or the sun's not shining. And that's the purpose of the Gigafactory, although I gather there are other ways of storing energy. Um, there's a company in uh, the north of England in Greater Manchester which has found a way of, of using that excess energy to cool down air from the atmosphere to absolute zero and then when it's needed to allow the air to heat back up or heat it back up and use a turbine to generate electricity. It's told about 70-80% efficient. Um, we also need a national network for electric cars, plug-in network. If we're going to move towards this carbon neutral environment and get rid of cars on the road, this is extremely needed right now uh, and I would expect us to see over the next three to five years some fairly major rollouts and projects around this. Uh, again, the government has announced some fairly major rail and road upgrades. I think the southwest of England, um, as the guys at Simplicity were telling me, is due for upgrades on the, uh, the um, line from Paddington and, and down to the, um, the Devon and Cornwall area. Um, so I think there's some huge opportunities here. There's some big, fairly big road projects as well. And finally, we're not going to dwell on this too long, but obviously we've talked about HS2. There's also the talk about HS3 to reduce the length of time that travel between Manchester, Leeds, uh, Liverpool and Sheffield, bringing those cities closer together will accelerate growth in those economies, will help them grow faster, will add to the northern powerhouse. So that's the theory. That's essentially where we are. There's a large number of projects there, there are others, but it's hundred billion pounds on top of what is already being spent. And that is going to stimulate the economy. Uh, and number two, this is the sector that I've tipped for the last five or ten years to be uh, the high growth sector for, uh, for the next ten year, decade, really. Um, and there's a reason for that. There are global issues that are happening and changes that are happening that are driving this. So we all know about Industrial Revolution 4.0. Um, there is something called Moore's Law. Um, somebody in one of your questions asked me, what is driving this technolog technological explosion. And it, and it has been what we call Moore's Law, which is every 18 months, the processing power of computers doubles. And it's been doing that on average for the last 20 to 25 years. It is starting to slow down, but we'll come back to that in a minute. But that growth of processing power allows us to have 5G phones. It allows us to have mobile phones that are more powerful than the computers that were used in the 1970s by the banks and to put man on the moon. Um, so that processing power, that allows 
uh, IT uh, technology workers to build smaller and smaller devices that are more and more powerful and useful. Um, we're also moving into the world of artificial intelligence, robotics, because obviously you don't need a huge supercomputer the size of a, of a uh, four-drawer filing cabinet any longer because you can put it on the size of my finger now. And those things can therefore go into robotics and we've got drones and everything else. Um, two, give you just two statistics. Two statistics give you the size and the scale of the opportunity for those of you who are in recruitment. So data is the new oil, uh, is what we're being told. And currently, we produce, in the last 18 months, more data has been produced than, than has ever been produced in the history of the world. And that is true every 18 months as we go forward, because we are constantly producing more and more data. What we need are analysts to analyze that data, and that currently, there is a shortfall of 346,000 data analyst jobs across Europe. Those jobs are not filled. All that happens is when you fill one, you create one from over here. And that number is constantly growing. So that is something we need to fix. There's an opportunity there for recruitment agencies to go into that sector, to help fill those jobs, and to work with the good employers that have got strong um, EVP, or that stands for Employee Value Propositions, to go out there and attract those people for them. The other sector, the other figure that I'm banding around today is 291,000 jobs in cyber security across Europe. And so these are just two niche sectors. I could go on with a whole la uh, list of others. Um, for the Simplicity customers, you can look on the Simplicity website, and I think there is a blog which has all of the other uh, skills gaps in this sector. But it's huge. It's a massive opportunity. Uh, but this year, we've relegated it to number two. Um, but going forward, this would, would be the number one sector to be in. And it's like the, it's like the technology fashion industry, because every 12, 18 months, two years, a new bit of tech comes on, and not everybody has that tech. And so you have to go out and recruit these people. And so th the agencies that know where the workers with the latest tech are, are the most successful. So finally, we move on to the number one sector for growth in the UK. And you've probably all worked out which one it is. Um, so we predict that in the next 12 months, construction will be the sector to grow the highest. There's two reasons for that. The first one is that we are seeing a huge investment in infrastructure we've already talked about in engineering along the light side the engineering infrastructure will also be construction so we're going to have bridges built uh, we're going to have new dams and reservoirs we're going to have there's a whole raft of things the government are talking about hospitals um, we're also going to have one million new homes in the next five years that's the projection of the government that again requires construction um, there's been some pent-up demand of foreign investment from China, the US, and Norway. Uh, I'm told the Norwegian uh, pension funds have been looking to invest in the UK now for about 12, 18 months. They've been waiting for the UK future to become a little bit more stable, a bit more uh, certain, and the certainty has arrived. We, you know, we know where we're going to be to a degree, I hasten to add, with Brexit. We have a stable government. So that pent-up demand is being released. Um, for example, I'm told that there's a billion pounds alone going to be invested in new hotels and conference centers and uh, infrastructure in Sheffield. 8% um, of the workers in this sector come from Europe. That's a lot lower than it was three or four years ago. In the last two to three years since Brexit's been announced, a large number of these have gone back. In fairness, it's not just because of Brexit. It's indirectly because of Brexit. The, the value of the pound has dropped, which means if you're a Polish worker, you're not sending as much money back to Poland as you were three or five year, two to three years ago. So the differential isn't as great. So a number of them have moved back to Europe because their own economy is getting better, or they've gone to other parts of Europe. Um, what we have seen as a result of that is an 8.1% increase in the amount of wages that are paid to UK construction workers, or the workers that are still in the sector. 
So that, again, has a positive effect upon Simplicity customers. Um, it also has a negative effect on construction companies because I'm to pay that money and I don't suppose they've been able to put up the price of buildings by 8.5%, which means their margins will have been squeezed. So some of you will know about liquidity issues in construction at the moment um, and may have had an impact of that. And we've obviously had the effects of a couple of big construction businesses like Carillion and Lagan going, going into liquidation. Um, one of the questions we were asked was what are the areas that we see um, the shortage is uh, impacting. Well, as we move into the middle of the year, when construction is normally at its peak due to the weather, we, are, we expect there to be huge shortages of bricklayers, electricians and scaffolders, just to name the top three. Already, already on the clients that I work with and that uh, in the construction sector, we are already seeing about a 15 to 20% increase in demand for workers in January compared with previous Januaries. Um, I don't wish to frighten the government, but we don't have all of the workers we need to complete a lot of the projects. There's also question marks about well, whether we have the bricks and the roof tiles to build a million new houses in the next five years. So it's going to be interesting and challenging times. But those of you who are really good in recruitment, who have great uh, resource teams for finding the candidates and filling your jobs, then this is a great opportunity for you. And if you're in construction, I would suggest that you know this is this is going to come back from the lean times. The reason why this is number one is because in Q3 and Q4 of last year, construction um, productivity dropped quite low. Um, it was not a sector to be in. And I think one of the reasons why we see it as a high growth sector for this year is because it's coming from a really low base. Um, already, we've, I'm aware of a few recruitment consultants in this sector that have gone into liquidation or have ceased trading in the last three to four months. But I think there's an awful lot of opportunity for those that remain to take advantage of the opportunities and grow and you know, maybe restructure their businesses. So that's, that's the top five. Um, there's a curveball, which we cannot move on without mentioning. And that is the HMRC's uh, rules or the new impl implementation of their rules on IR35. IR35 has been around for five, ten years. Everyone's aware of it, but the way the HMRC are applying the rules is changing. It's changing in the public sector, as we mentioned earlier. At the moment, it's, there's plans to change it from April the 1st this year. Um, although I'm I gather the government is currently reviewing this. But the net effect is what we are seeing is 30 to 50 percent premiums being offered to UK workers who are in IT, engineering, energy, financial services and project management to move offshore. Um, a couple of my big construction clients are already telling me there's been a shift towards the Middle East and mainland Europe. My advice and my comment to the government would be it's a lot harder to entice these workers back when they're already working in a tax-free environment and have shifted their family and living situation so that they can, they can live five or six months a year in Dubai or the Middle East. So I do think it's something we need to think twice about as a nation. I'm not here to advocate that personal service companies should carry on as they are, but I think we need to think about at a time when we're trying to use all these skills why are we giving some of the engineers the incentive to go offshore uh, where their premiums for what they can earn with their skill set is quite high. Uh, but we have to wait and see. It's a curveball. It's going to affect some of those sectors. How much? We don't know. Construction is not affected as much because of the CIS scheme, um, but obviously there are impacts there as well. Okay, so finally, uh, as we mentioned previously in some of the, in the other um, growth um, seminars, uh, we are launching, or I'm launching, or Selling Success are launching, a accelerated growth program. It's uh, workshops which, with coaching sessions, uh, there will be six, uh, sorry, three two-day workshops run in Q1 of, ne of this year. Uh, it involves, uh, in addition to that, some one-to-one -one coaching. There's a diagnostic we use to identify what are the key areas for growth for your business and what are the inhibitors to growth. 
um, and then th that is fed back to you one to one and, and we help create you a plan for your business. It's been hugely, hugely successful. Um, we focus on the what we call the seven P's, which are the seven areas of profitability and, and growth that will impact your business. So that includes the people, your proposition, your profitability, your productivity, the platform your business operates from, the playing field, the niches you're in, and what is your overall purpose? What is your niche? What is your vision? So um, uh, we started working with this company here, Alpha Recruitment in Construction in 2013. They turned over 1.2 million people. There was an MD and two staff, average margins of one point, sorry, one pound 55 an hour, and they were working a rented room. Today, there's an MD with over 10 staff. They will turn over about seven and a half to eight million. They're in a purpose-built office. The MD delivers very little of the business, whereas he was delivering 80%. So that's the kind of movement we've been able to make with Alpha. Uh, we work with new staff, uh, business down in Chepstow. Again, their business has grown. We help them, they're a simplicity customer. Uh, we've helped them create a vision for, for this year and beyond. We've introduced a new staff bonus scheme, a new social media and website strategy, uh, a new customer care and customer service strategy, and we've launched a driver division. Um, the business has, gr has doubled in size in the last two years and has got plans to do that again in the next two years. So that just gives you an idea of the sort of things we, we would do. We would love to hear from you if you're interested. Um, but any other questions you've got about what we've talked about, please drop them to Simplicity Marketing at simplicityinbusiness.com. Um, or you can send them to me. Uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Make sure you just mention why you're connecting. But I hope that's been useful. Have a great 2020. Send us your details of how successful you've been, and we look forward to talking to you again later in the year. Thanks so much indeed. Bye-bye.